A species of petrel, commonly known as the Tasmanian mutton bird, returns each spring to nest in the islands around southeastern Australia. They come from the north in flocks totaling many millions and migrate down the east coast of the continent to their breeding grounds in and around Bass Strait to the north of Tasmania. One flock so impressed Matthew Flinders during his exploration of the Ferno Islands in 1798 that he described it in his diary. There was a stream of from 50 to 80 yards in depth and 300 yards or more in breadth. And during a full hour and a half, this stream of petrels continued to pass without interruption at a rate little inferior to the swiftness of a pigeon. On the lowest computation, I think the number would not have been less than a hundred millions. These birds nest in large numbers on scores of small islands in the Ferno group. And sealers who came in the wake of Flinders were quick to exploit them for food, fat and oil. Nowadays, adult birds and eggs are protected and the industry is restricted to taking fledglings between two and three and a half months old. In the Ferno group, the mutton birding industry is centered on five commercial islands. The largest is Babel, so named by Flinders from the confusion of tongues of its many kinds of bird inhabitants, penguins, gannets, cormorants, mutton birds and gulls. Other commercial islands in this area are Chapel, Great Dog and Little Dog, and Little Green Island. For the people of Flinders Island, the opening of the birding on March the 23rd is the event of the year. In the weeks before, visitors from the mainland arrive. The school closes. Islanders leave their farms. They make for Lady Barron, the small seaport at the south of Flinders Island. Cape Barron Islanders too come to take their traditional part in the harvest. Boats are chartered and food supplies, drums for oil, boxes, salt, and all the paraphernalia needed for six weeks' stay are stowed aboard. Even a Land Rover is shipped to Babel. Small cutters are used to reach the closer islands, while larger vessels make the voyages to Babel and Chapel. Birders land their gear by dinghy on the small beaches or rocky shore platforms below their sheds. Each shed unit is double, one building for accommodation and the other for processing the mutton birds. This is a busy time for the birders, especially if a new shed is to be built. Finally, spits are sharpened and stacked ready for the opening of the season. And so, at dawn on March the 23rd, the slaughter begins. The fledglings are removed from their burrows and killed by a sharp jerk of the arm. The catchers work systematically through the rookeries and examine all likely burrows. They thread the birds by their beaks on wooden spits made of manuka, the local tea tree, keeping their heads upward to retain the crop oil, an important byproduct. A good man's daily tally is very nearly a thousand birds and he carries his own catch back to the shed. His average load might be 60 birds and weighs about 120 pounds. At the processing shed, the crop oil is squeezed into a collecting drum. 20 birds yield about a gallon of oil at the peak of the season, but there is none in the last few weeks. After refining, it will be sold for medicinal use. After plucking, the birds are scalded 
and the remaining down is rubbed off. The carcasses are left to cool before being opened up, dressed and salted. The main part of the catch is salt cured. Weather permitting, fresh birds are sent to the freezing works at Lady Barron. Fresh birds are repacked in flat wooden cases and frozen. In recent years, relatively more of the catch has been marketed in the fresh state transported by air to the consuming center. Tasmanians are the largest buyers, regarding the flesh of the young bird as a delicacy. Over half a million birds were taken in 1954, and they netted over 40,000 pounds for the inhabitants of Flinders Island. How long can the rookery stand such intense harvesting? Little wonder that the government of Tasmania was concerned for the future of the mutton bird. So the CSIRO joined forces with the Fauna Board of Tasmania to investigate its biology and life history. In 1947, a field station was set up on Fisher Island off Lady Barron, strategically placed in the midst of three commercial islands. A hut serves as a laboratory, living quarters and storehouse for field equipment. On Fisher, the biology of the mutton bird is studied intensively supplemented by excursions to nearby islands. Statistics compiled over a number of years will show whether the commercial rookeries are being depleted and if so, what measures must be applied to maintain them. Tussock grass, Poa Poa formis, which covers most of the island, predominates in all the rookeries around Tasmania. Between the tussocks, the birds scratch out their nesting burrows to a depth of about three feet. Some birds also nest in this little grove of sea buried saltbush and coast wattle on the south end of the island. About 150 pairs of mutton birds nest on Fisher, but their presence is not obvious in the daytime. Even the entrances to their burrows are hidden, partly covered by tufts of grass and other debris blown there by the wind. After sunset, the birds return from the sea. On the larger islands, the air is filled with flying, wheeling forms, and the caterwauling of these hundreds of thousands of birds is deafening. <laughs> they land within a few feet of the entrance to their burrows and make their way below ground. Mutton birds are particularly helpless on the ground. Birds remaining on land in the daytime do not leave the shelter of their burrows, as they are easy prey for predators such as large gulls and hawks. Within an hour of the first arrivals, the pandemonium subsides. But just before dawn, it rises again as the birds make their way to the takeoff rocks for the communal exodus out to sea. They do not easily become airborne and usually make a running takeoff into the wind or plummet themselves from an eminence. Streams of departing birds converge on rocky outcrops on the densely populated islands. Prominent rocks are marked by scratches of untold generations of birds which have used them for takeoff platforms. By dawn, the birds remaining on land are safely hidden underground.
Here is one protesting adult occupant of the Fisher Island burrows. The species derives its scientific name, Puffinus tenurostris, from the long, slender beak, which is lead and grey in colour. The dusky appearance of the underwing coverts is also characteristic, although on some individuals they may be almost white. The short fan-shaped tail has given the species its popular book name, short-tailed shearwater. The legs are blackish grey on the outer aspect and tinged with purple on the inner. Notice on this bird's leg a monal metal ring. On Fisher Island, every mutton bird is banded and has its distinguishing number. A census of the Fisher Island rookeries is taken each season and to ensure that no burrow is overlooked, the island is surveyed in narrow strips. Each burrow is marked with a neat numbered peg and a detailed map of the rookery is drawn up. Each ringed bird is recorded in the field book as the occupant of a particular burrow. A dab of paint of distinctive colour on the stake indicates that this burrow has been inspected. A precy of the field notes is made in a card index with a card for every bird. Statistics from these records reveal many interesting characteristics of mutton birds. For instance, they are monogamous and usually take the same mate each year. They return invariably to the same burrow site even if the burrow has been destroyed in the meantime. Female 12591 was first recorded nesting on Fisher in 1948, occupying burrow 297, to which she has returned ever since. She had the same mate till 1953, though he was not checked in during 1949. They were divorced in 1953 and each took a new mate in the same little neighbourhood. Banding experiments will eventually make it possible to calculate the mean life expectancy of mutton birds. Many of the birds ringed in 1947 returned to Fisher Island for the eighth successive season in 1954. As in most petrels, both sexes have similar external features, but they are easily distinguished in the breeding season. The unlaid egg in the mother bird can be felt as a hard protuberance in the belly region. The clerical opening of the male is inconspicuous, rounded and small, while in the female it is a prominent transverse slit with lips swollen and tumid. After egg laying, the opening becomes widely distended and the clerical lips bloodshot. The female lays only one egg each year. The first eggs are laid about the night of November the 21st, reaching a climax by November the 25th. The laying season ends about the 2nd of December. These dates have not varied materially since the first observations were recorded over a century ago. The egg is disproportionately large. The adult bird weighs one pound to a pound and a half, while the egg averages just over three ounces, about one-sixth of the bird's own weight. Egg laying is a considerable ordeal and the female, after resting in the burrow for a day or two, goes out to sea to feed and recuperate. The male remains sitting on the egg alone and unfed until the female returns about 13 days later. The parents continue to change over every 13 days until the egg hatches, about 54 days after laying. Between the 13th and 23rd of January, practically all eggs in the rookery hatch out. When two or three days old, the chick is left by its parents in the daytime, but at night one returns to feed it a gargantuan banquet of krill and oil. If neither parent returns, it must fast, sometimes for as long as 15 days. At the peak of its growth, the young bird averages a pound heavier than the adult, often scaling two and a half pounds. As the season progresses, the body weight falls, feathers appear and the down is shed. The fledglings are finally deserted by their parents in mid-April and now patrol the rookery at night, exercising their wings.
They leave the island when about 100 days old. When ready to depart, they make their way to the water's edge or a suitable takeoff point. With the coming of day, birds of prey drop down to feast on any fledglings exposed on the ground. Others take to the water and are soon on their way. The young birds feed at sea to build up their strength before following the course taken by their parents. The route cannot be accurately plotted but the available evidence shows their migration covers a vast circuit of the Pacific. In late April and May, many birds are reported along New Zealand beaches and in the vicinity of the Marshall Islands. In June, they are seen near Japan and along the coast of Alaska. They stay in this region till the end of the northern summer, large flocks frequenting the Bering Straits. By September, the southward migration is underway, down the coast of Canada and across the Pacific. The adult birds reach the breeding ground soon after the third week in September. The immature birds travel later and may continue to come in until December and January. During the migration, many birds die or lose their way. The greatest losses occur along the Australian coast where countless thousands may perish each year, apparently through starvation. The mortality varies. 1934 and the years around 1940 were bad years. Another heavy mortality in 1954 was the largest yet recorded. How these losses affect bird population strength is not yet known. The results of exploitation by man are more easily determined. Before the yearly harvest, a sample number of young birds is banded at random throughout the commercial rookeries. The catchers will retake many of these birds, and from the number of rings returned after the season, the intensity of harvesting can be calculated. In 1954, 1,650 young birds were ringed on four commercial islands, and of these, 60% were retaken during the harvest. Yet, despite this high rate of exploitation, the records show these rookeries are not being depleted. Why then have mutton birds disappeared from large areas on some islands? Investigations have shown grazing animals to be responsible. The natural habitat of the birds is disturbed by eating down the grassy cover, trampling in the burrows and hardening the ground. Soil hardness figures determined with a penetrometer show that the harder the ground, the fewer the number of burrows occurring in any given area. Erosion is another serious problem, particularly on the mainland of Tasmania. This sand blow at Cape Contrarity was probably started by rabbiters digging out burrows. Similar havoc is taking place in some of the rookeries on Phillip Island in Victoria. It is comforting to know that even though commercial interests take their yearly toll, this in itself does not harm the colonies. If only their natural environment can be preserved, there is no reason why the mutton birds of Bass Strait should not fly for eons to come in the same thrilling abundance which amazed Flinders and delights the present-day bird watcher and ocean voyager. <laughs>